please excuse me as I kind of muddle through this. Famously, my father and I had a, a nice kind of a diatribe about how I didn't like to prepare for anything, let alone write. So this is a nice little final joke between him and I as I freewheel it and go off of the written you know, word, so to speak. And I'm going to be very millennial because it's on my cell phone and I'm terrible, but you know, as I'm here this morning, you know, I'm looking around and I'm bickering with my mother and I have a stain on my shirt and I like, you know, and I'm trying to figure out is it the front gate or the back gate, you know, that we have to get in here and oh god, I don't have a vaccine card and everything's going wrong and then suddenly a sunlight just hits my face and I'm like, dad's getting the kick out of this. And dad thrived in chaos and it didn't matter what the hurricane was. He was able to just get his sea legs, which was even more funny because he was the most seasick person ever. So when dad would look at a situation, he'd take a beat, he'd close his eyes, and he said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And then he would ask everybody in the room, tell me what the problem is. And he wouldn't interrupt you. Between me and my sisters, I asked a quick question. Hey, have you ever heard dad interrupt anybody in your entire life? They said no. And that was probably the most insane thing ever because we live in a world and a culture where everybody's just trying to get to their point. And they're like, can you stop talking so I can speak, please? And dad sat here with the honest commitment to listen to whatever you had to say to give her its full consideration and engagement, and more importantly, to provide his insight into what was the issue. And for that, dad was unique. You know, it, it strikes me that I'm standing next to the very lectern that I have my first memory of my father. He gave a speech in this room uh, about diversity and inclusion that I have no memory of at all. But I remember being just in complete awe because at that point, you know, he had a command of the room, of the word, of the moment, of who he was speaking to. He could play to the audience. And let's admit, he looked a lot like Phil Jackson. And that helps in terms of just pure leadership. But he had a way about him that was effortless. And if you can't tell by my own delivery, he was really funny. And in funny in a way in terms of embracing timing. And I got to speak to guys that served with him in Vietnam. And he said, Dad's greatest joke in Vietnam was he was always there when we needed him. And he loved playing the Calvary. And we used to ask him, well, why don't you go up front next time and actually get these guys before they start firing at us? And he's like, well, then how would I be the hero? <laughs> Dad, you know, Dad's favorite movie was uh, Blazing Saddles. <laughs> and some of you are ahead of me on the joke. But he loved that part where everybody, in, you know, bewilderingly says, the black sheriff. And his version of that was a black Coast Guardsman in Vietnam. And in that way, he, was, he embraced the unique absurdity of it all. Because to him, it wasn't about being the first. I used to ask him, why'd you go to Coast Guard? And he said, because Otto Graham wasn't anywhere else. And the fact that he was going to be the first, the fact that there were some that wouldn't even consider the Coast Guard, you know, a military service. But he's like, I'm going to be a soldier. And then I'm going to volunteer for Vietnam. And that in itself was a testament to his will. Because not just having the bravery to do so, but I'm going to tell a story that probably most of you don't know except my uncle. When he told my, pa my grandparents that he was going to go to Vietnam, it was a point of contention. My grandfather had received his orders to take over a battalion in Vietnam, and he was going to get a star. At the time, 
my grandmother simply couldn't take the idea of having both her husband and her son in combat at the same time. And my father said, look, this is my chance to prove that I'm worthy of command. And I don't know a better way to do it. And my grandfather looked at him and he said, are you sure? And at the time, you can't imagine what that meant, that star in the 60s. To every black person in uniform, what had my grandfather, what his family had endured as people to get to that point. And my grandfather said, okay. And he put in his papers the next day and retired so that he could be with my grandmother while my dad proved himself. And that story is important today because you have to understand the history of African Americans, particularly in this institution, stretches further back than my dad. It was men and women in the uniform that weren't even in this particular service that were making sacrifices so that we can have what we have in this room today. And I was with, I had the for, good fortune of being with my dad both times when he found out that Vice Admiral Manson Brown got his appointment and uh, when Rear Admiral Hale Brown got his appointment. And uh, both times my dad cried. And he said, they got it. They got the star. I wish dad could see this. And I know he couldn't communicate that story, but what it meant for two men of his lineage that were deeper than his brothers to achieve that was, uh, it meant the world. It made everything worth it. Dad was, uh, was my person. I was not easy or functional as a teenager. You know, I had a violent temper. I did not like conforming to anything anyone told me. And Dad, most importantly, had started his battle with Parkinson's 20 years ago. And the effect it had on him was huge in terms of how he thought, communicated, what he could do. But as he fought that battle, he saved my life 30 times. He changed my direction. He corrected me every single time that I veered. And he was a guiding hand that was able to keep his demons at bay while fighting for me. I said to Dad, after years of, you know, hard work, you know, I got through high school, graduated, you know, was able to be good enough at football that I had a few uh, recruits, and, you know, I got into West Point and Coast Guard and a bunch of other smaller schools and some D1s, and I was like, I'm going to go to West Point because that's what the family should do. You know, that's, that's the family business, being a soldier. And my girlfriend at the time, that's now my wife, um, in high school, says, I'm not going to be a military wife. You know, I can't do it. That's not, you know, for me. And I called Dad. I came back home, and I was bawling because I was like, Dad, I don't know what to do. You know, I want to be a soldier. I want to do this. But I don't, you know, I, I don't want to disappoint you. And I had worked so hard at that point. And he said, look, getting shot at isn't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> and you're going to go to Amherst, and, you know, they've got a good football team. And I'm pretty sure Otto's been retired for years, so he's not going to be mad. <laughs> so he said, you know, go live your life. And that permission, that acceptance of who I was at that time was what I needed. And 
you know, Dad was more than anything, he was a human, a humanist that just loved people. And I would be remiss if I didn't say at this point a thank you to the community of New London, which embraced my father in his later years and how many people helped him, you know, if he was going on the street or, you know, just checked in and made sure he was okay and he knew where he was going. And look, dad could come, could, could summon it, summon the moment anytime he wanted to. You know, when he was presented with an award here, him, my mother and I were bickering of who, how he was going to do the speech and who was going to have to go up. And he was already up on the stage. And then he gave the speech. And mind you, we hadn't heard him talk in two weeks. And he went, went through it flawlessly. And dad just could, I don't know if it was divine or, or if he let a spirit talk through him or whatever, I choose to believe that he was saving up what really mattered to say when it needed to be said. And he knew he only had so many words. So what I would say to you all is that dad truly gave everything that he could. And he would say yes to things no matter what. If, you know, he didn't, he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to do it, but he was definitely going to give everything, everything, and leave it all, you know, on the field, so to speak. And in that spirit, I would say to you all, you know, one thing that my father told me that I've carried with me as a mantra is you can't always do the right thing, but you should try. And imagine how much better the world would be if we all just tried. And as a community of individuals, as institutions, as, you know, the framework that we sit upon right now, you know, as a society, and society is at a precipice, let's think about how we can make everything better if we just try a little harder. And maybe even make it better than we expect it to because my dad made an entire career out of defying expectations. And I would say he expects that of us at the bare minimum, to be better than we thought we could be. So thank you all and God bless.